Okay, so uh, Lydia Kennaway. Um, Lydia's debut pamphlet, A History of Walking, was published by Happenstance in 2019. And in the same year, she earned an MA in writing poetry from Newcastle University. Her work has appeared in 10 anthologies and in many magazines. She won the Flambard Poetry Prize in 2017 and was commended in the 2021 Magma Poetry Competition. Lydia, over to you to introduce Anthony and good luck. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here. And welcome to everyone who's turned up for a Footloose number two. Um, thank you for the ones who came to Footloose number one and have come back for more. And thank you for those who are trying it out for the first time. This happens every month on the last Monday of the month. So my guest this evening is Anthony Dunn. Anthony has published four collections of poems and is a regular tutor for the Poetry School and the Arvon Foundation. He won the Newdigate Prize in 1995 and an Eric Gregory Award in 2000. Andrew is current, uh, Anthony is currently poet in residence at the People Powered Press. Tonight he'll be reading from his collection, Take This One to Bed. If you don't already have a copy, uh, there will be a link in the chat that will take you to Walkless and Create's bookshelf uh, where you can buy a copy. I should add that it was thanks to Anthony's guidance and encouragement in his poetry classes that I decided to go on and do the Poetry MA in Newcastle. Thanks a lot, Anthony. Um, as Andrew said, if you'd like to read along with either of tonight's poems, there will be links in, uh, for that too in the chat. You might just want to close your eyes and listen when we're reading our poems um, and then refer to the text afterwards when we're discussing them. So tonight on Footloose, we're going on a ghost walk, actually two ghost walks. Both Anthony's poem and mine are in part about walking with dead poets. In my case, it's Walt Whitman. And in Anthony's, it's Robert Frost and Edward Thomas. Our two poems are really very different, but in form and content, but they're both elegies in their own ways. I'll read my poem first. Uh, Anthony will comment. And only when he's had his say will I chip in with my perspective. Um, we'll take the same approach with Anthony's poem and then we'll talk about the emotional landscapes um, shared by the two poems. So the poem I'm going to read is called Returning to Pomenoc and it's from A History of Walking. Um, Pomenoc is the Native American word for Long Island in New York State. Um, it was the birthplace of Walt Whitman and also my own birthplace. And the poem was inspired by Whitman's poem, starting from Pomenoc. Um, Whitman's poem is really kind of a poetic manifesto. Um, it's, it's promoting democracy in all things but especially in language and in poetry. Um, and it's kind of cinematic in the way it portrays a, a young nation on the verge of uh, industrialization. So in the poem, I'm not going to give too much of, um, by the way, is the sound all right? Are you getting this okay? Because I'm getting a bit, of, a bit of random sound coming back to me. Um, can you give me a thumbs up if you can hear me all right? Yeah, okay. Um, I'm not going to give a huge introduction because that wouldn't leave uh, Anthony anything to guess about. But I'll tell you that in the poem, I'm returning to my birth country at the time of the Trump administration. And I mourn the changes that I find there, um, the, the national changes as well as my own personal losses. I'm also poking a bit of fun at Whitman. Um, I refer to Stephen Talkus, who was a Native American of the uh, Montauk people. And he was famous for his epic walks, like 50 miles a day. Um, he, he was often employed as a letter carrier. 
Um, the poem begins with an epigraph, which is a quote from Whitman's poem. And I will make a song for the ears of the president, full of weapons with menacing voices, menacing points, and behind the weapons, countless dissatisfied faces. Walt Whitman, starting from Pomonok. Returning to Pomonok. Across six lanes, the setting sun blazes in plate glass below the tubular pink of storefront signs. Food town, Massapequa nails, urgent care. The air is thick with the smell of gasoline, burgers, warm asphalt, and sea salt. I walk in the ditch beside the highway with the stitched line of the railroad to my right, beyond the switchgrass. Flip-flops slap my heels. Haste on with me, Walt. Point your beard to Manahata and fill my head with your chants. I will tell you what we've done to your beloved country. Oh, where are your songs for the ears of the president? Haste on with me, Tokus, legendary walker. Plant your stick in the sand and tell me the ways of the Montauket and how to cover 50 miles in a day. Oh, where are your children's children and their children? Haste on with me, my younger self. Put your small hand in mine and run beside me. Show me what's untouched by the seven year renewal of ourselves. Oh, where are your brothers, your father, your mother? I place my feet carefully and watch the soil for rusty cans, broken shells, the currency of conch and quahog. Then the hot breath of a car pulling up beside me. The driver leans across. We talk before he takes his mirrored smile to the horizon. His words slap my heels. You broken down, you broken down, you broken down. Thank you. So now it's Andrew, uh, Anthony's turn to comment. Um, and then I'll um, respond. Well, I think it's really very good. Over to you. <laughs> um, well, it's a it's a fascinating one, and it, it's um, it's very rich and full of interesting things. And you did in your introduction talk your way very neatly through all of my notes. Um, but I, but <laughs> which I <laughs> promised I wouldn't do. Yes, you did, you did. but that's quite all right. I have other things to say about it too. Um, it is interesting to take. Whitman as a I mean I, I I'm guessing you take Whitman as a starting point um or although of course that may have occurred to you some way into the composition of the poem but um Whitman seems to be a very interesting figure to to have hanging over all of this for loads and loads of different reasons um it, so it did send me back to the poem which I have to confess I don't know well I'm not one of those people with a with an extremely high tolerance for Whitman I have to say um, find it very, very hard work. Uh, and starting from Pormanok is, is, I think, particularly hard work in a way because, because it's a mad purple through what in 1860 or the couple of years up to 1860 would have been contemporary American culture. Um, but what I think is thrilling about the poem is the sense of something being born but out of a sense of great loss um, and the thing that is being lost in the Whitman poem I, I, I think if I if I am reading it correctly is is everything to do with Native American culture which is being traduced, constricted, forgotten about, misnamed, everything is being done to erase it um, and there's a sort of deep, deep tragedy in that. And um, the interesting thing about the Montaukett that you reference uh, in stanza one, two, three, four, five, six, six, six um, is 
they, as a tribe of Native Americans, were actually declared extinct in 1879 by a court when they stood in the way of some real estate development. Um, it is also interesting, one thing you didn't mention is that Stephen Torcus Farrow, to give him his full name, um, was, uh, uh, he died um, apparently walking home. And as a legendary walker, the idea of him dying in the middle of a walk is, is a little bit bizarre. Um, and it's felt by some commentators, at least, that he was possibly done away with because he was going to be quite an efficient campaigner against this plot of real estate that ended up having the Montauk disappear from the annals of history, basically. So I, you have a slightly surprised look on your face. I, I'm very surprised. Yes, I hadn't. I, I read about him and I've, there's, a, there's a bar called Talk House. Um, in Eastern Long Island, name for him, but uh, I didn't hear that story of him being possibly done away with. Sure, but um, um, we're not really here to talk about Whitman, um, but, it, it, but he obviously hangs very heavy over the poem, and I think it's really good to contextualise that. So Whitman's poem does a lot to do with the changing of one nation into another, and I think so does yours. I think that's the honest truth. Um, and I look at the very beginning, these six lanes and the setting sun blazing in the plate glass below the tubular pink of storefront signs, and nothing says contemporary America more clearly than, <laughs> than that, I suspect, at least certain parts of contemporary USA life. Um, and I love the way you just you chuck in Massapeka into that context, which feels, you know, let's not forget where this has all come from and, you know, the bits of the bits of our sort of dying history that we choose to memorialize or you know fetishize or romanticize mm -hmm. and consumerize um and then there's this beautiful urgent care and i <laughs> can't quite figure out what what a shop that's advertising urgent care might actually be dealing in but i'll come back to that in a bit um so i love the gasoline and the burgers and the asphalt and this all says contemporary 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 uh and then what happens the narrator is walking in the ditch between the highway and the railroad. So choosing one of the paths available that is not contemporary, but it's the scrubland, the, the wildness that remains in between the bits that mankind has built upon and spoilt to whatever degree we might believe that that represents spoiling. Um, and little touches of, you know, the, the biographical topography even switchgrass you know the, the naming of things the naming of things just takes us out of the you know the tubular pink of the storefront signs and takes us back to a world that is somewhat stuck in the past and there's that lovely sense of being stuck between things there um and then we we start addressing walt whitman come on walt let's go for a walk and uh, <laughs> And yeah, there's this terrible sense that Whitman and the men and women of his generation might actually just be utterly horrified by what they were to discover in the year in which your poem was written. Um, and there's that ter there's a terrible lament. Where are your songs for the ears of the president? And actually, just to go back to the Whitman, poem, a few lines before the lines that you quote in your epigraph uh, are the lines, I will make a song for these states that no one state may under any circumstances be subjected to another state. And of course, what Whitman's talking about are the states of the United States of America or you know, the states of America. Um, just today, of course, the resonance of that is so gut-loosening,ly vast, isn't it? That yes. both your poem and his, I think, take on a whole new life and that is on the one hand horrifying and on the other hand thrilling because isn't this what poems are meant to do to inhabit the time in which the reader finds them successfully and powerfully and movingly and there we go you didn't mean that when you wrote it but you wrote it and there it is um so and again this this lament for Torcus comes on and um I, I, you know, I did, I did have to take to Google. Uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not a talkers expert, so I have done some, uh, some a little bit of uh, delving away. Um, 
but the, the lament continues with where are your children's children and their children and this sense of the generations and the generations and the generations is very powerful and then of course the poem does its flip it takes its its proper turn into something else and when the author when the narrator starts addressing um her let's assume for the sake of argument it is a her younger self i thought that was beautiful i just thought that was beautiful and to have built that out of this idea of the seven year renewal of ourselves you know in physical terms we are not the same person that we were seven years ago and yet and yet and yet of course we are because we are our collection of memories and ideas and all of the things that don't die and get replaced they develop and grow and change and so forth but but they're the, the sort of essence within the body and then the brothers and your father and your mother felt like on the one hand kind of philosophical constructs you know our forefathers our people our tribe but also so horrifyingly specific and personal and an actual set of brothers and a father and a mother and there's this terrible sense that not only is the narrator lost in contemporary America and now you've contextualized it we can say particularly Trump's America but there's this sense of being lost as an individual who might once have had more of a community than now she does and that felt awfully awfully sad um but really pleasing in the way it plays both of those games simultaneously. So it does that particular and it does that universal and I think it does that really successfully and I enjoyed that terribly much. Um, and then the feet in the flip-flops, terribly vulnerable, particularly since you've decided to take the strange step of walking in the ditch um, amongst <laughs> the, the rusty cans, the broken shells, the currency of conch, which is a seashell and quay hog, which is now my new favourite word, which I think is a hard clam, is it not? It's a yes, kind of clam. They clam. were both used in the construction, in the making of wampum, so they, they were used as currency. Ah, ah, okay, great. Literally currency. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the, the walking takes place in, in an unfriendly environment, and it's full of detritus and rubbish and sharp edges and abandonment and you know it's not the place you choose to walk but then again where where in contemporary usa in in the city areas is there to walk I, the way i gather it you just drive and that's that um or take the train so maybe walking is just not a safe activity in this particular environment but i don't i don't know long island so i can't say um the hot breath of the car and the driver, I think, is one of those rather delightful sort of poemy mysteries a bit. Um, not quite sure what the driver's doing, except representing something about contemporary society. Also kindness, um, which is nice. Um, a sort of... I don't know, there's, there's almost a sense of threat about it as well, which I'm sort of trying to put my finger on, but um, can't quite. I mean, there's it's something a bit scary about someone pulling over in a car and accosting you. Um, and then the driver speaks some kind of truth to the narrator that the narrator is utterly unprepared for, and which sort of blows the heart open, to use Seamusini's phrase, I think. Um, and it just threw me back to urgent care at the beginning. This, this urgent care, the narrator is in need of some urgent care, but perhaps isn't quite aware of it um, until the driver says this sort of rather contingent phrase, you've broken down, um, broken down as in, has your car broken down? But also what the narrator is hearing is, have you had an emotional breakdown? Have you had an emotional breakdown? Are you in the middle of an emotional breakdown? And that wallops us at the end that's a good old gut punch and um and I thought a fantastic end and, I, and I, I, it pleased me so much that it called back to urgent care that that just felt like you know there's a there's a poem properly constructed there and um and rewarding and that that idea of calling back to earlier points in a poem is always such a kind of gift 
to the reader and a help and uh and there's a sense of circularity in there that's that's maybe something almost generational as well and you know the, these tiny little resonances that i may just be completely imagining for myself that no one else would share but there's something in there for me about going round and around and around um and a sense of being trapped in this moment almost or trapped in a cycle of moments or generations or changes of community and country so uh it feels to me like this is one of those poems you could read quickly and lazily and move on from and you'd really miss out um so a bit of a bit of careful reading and and repeated attention i think pays off brilliantly with this one here endeth my remarks <laughs> I don't, I don't know what to add to that. I mean, I, it always surprises me when people get the poem. <laughs> you know, yes. I don't know if you have that experience, you know. <laughs> I don't know you it's like speaking a foreign language and somebody understanding you, you know, asking a question in French or something and they actually respond and you understand. I feel that way when someone reads a poem of mine and, and gets it. Um, I'm just so surprised. Um, yeah, I, the the resonating back to the beginning. I'd never thought of of uh, urgent care as the resonating point. I thought of the the um, epigraph with the um, what was it, the broken spears. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the, the, the terms of yeah, well, full of weapons with menacing points. Um, yeah, I thought the, the brokenness would go back to the broken country. Um, I mean, one thing that our, our America and Whitman's, I mean, I was so surprised to find this part of his poem, you know, the, and behind the president, wep, um, weapons, countless dissatisfied faces. And that, that brought me up sharp, you know, yeah. I thought, well, so, some things don't change. Um, urgent care is, is a, you know, in the American health system, it is like a storefront A and E. Oh, it's okay. it's where you go rather than to a hospital if you know you've cut your hand. So um, is urgent is urgent care almost like a brand name then? No, um, no, but it's 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 like A and E as a term, but it, it'll say in big letters on the shop front. Um, because Americans shop for their, generally shop for their medical care. Um, you know, having a shop front is, is appropriate and that it's in there among Massapequa Nails and Food Town is just, yeah, the way it is. So, so tell me, because one thing that I always, always, always want to know about poems that I've admired is how much did it take you by surprise in the writing and or how much has it successfully done what you planned in the first instance? Um, it's hard to say because for me, writing a poem is a bit like childbirth. And you, if it's been successful, you put it out of your mind. <laughs> you, know? you just <laughs> concentrate on the product and uh, you don't really want to go back to remembering how difficult it was. I, I don't remember, I do remember certain poems that I struggled with and struggled with, and this wasn't one of them. Um, I, I did want to write about the experience. I mean, it, it originated in the concept for a history of walking in the experience of so many people who walk in America um, where there are no pavements and regularly drivers will pull over and ask if you're okay. Oh, okay. They, they genuinely can't imagine what you're doing out walking. You must have a broken down car somewhere because yeah. why else would you be walking? Um, I think things are changing, but you know, that was the way it was for, for many years. And I, I've, since this poem was published, I've had, um, I don't know, three or four people say, yeah, that happened to me in America. Mm -hmm. And you're right that a car pulling over, especially for a woman walking alone, is, is always a bit creepy. Um, and I intentionally didn't, didn't go into the details of our conversation, um, but just his parting 
you know, you've broken down. Um, well, thank you so much for, well, for doing your homework. I mean, that's, that's very impressive. <laughs> and yeah, and, and I always love it when someone sees something that I didn't in a poem, like in this case, urgent care. Yeah, it's fun, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I did a course with Jo Bell and she talked about the poem, A Swimming Pool, with the, the water sloshing back and forth between the, the two ends and how you get that movement in a good poem. Mm -hmm. But it goes back to the beginning and ripples back. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's a good oh, point. Thank you so much. And can we have, I think generally I don't go in for big introductions to poems, but I think both of these poems need some context. Um, so would you like to introduce your poem? Well, I will, uh, as, as briefly as I can, for fear of trampling upon your thoughts. Um, but uh, this poem uh, is the third part of a four-part poem, which is called Dimmock. Um, Dimmock is a village in Gloucestershire, which is beautiful. And uh, it is a place that Robert Frost and Edward Thomas spent some time together in. Uh, in the very early part of the First World War um, and in the run-up to Edward Thomas's um, rather long delayed decision to enlist and go and fight uh, and then very, very swiftly die. Um, these poems were written when I went there with my friend Matthew Hollis, uh, who is a poet and biographer. He at the time was researching a biography of Edward Thomas um, and I pissed him off royally by waking up every morning, turning out one of these sonnets uh, by the end of coffee time, and then feeling very uh, relaxed for the rest of the day while he <laughs> struggled through the writing of the biography. Over to you. Me, 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 over to me. It's me, isn't it? Over to you. This is Dimmock, part three. This final sun-stretched afternoon, we walk, we two, between the houses of the dead, then hill down, field edge, brook bank, furrow tread, and listen for the cadence of their talk in all we find we have to talk about. We have not been this way before, but should. And all the guns that busy in the wood and fighters overhead can't drown it out. But soon will come a stile or gate that you or I must climb to take a different path and all along your homeward grass or earth, by field, by farther field, keep talking through the clamour of the trees and all the birds, please, even if I can't make out the words. That's beautiful. So we have, as you say, a sonnet that <clears throat> starts with an ending, the final the final walk. And in the course of the walk, it feels to me that the two people come to embody um, the subject they're talking about. Um, there's, a, there's a kind of time warp that occurs um, in about, let's see, one, two, three, four, five. Yes. The, the very en enigmatic line, we have not been this way before, but should, and been this way is, you know, the route you're taking, but it's also the way you are with each other. And, and then we have all the guns that busy in the wood and fighters overhead can't drown it out. And I tried to rationalize it that, um, well, there could be hunters in the woods and there could be squawking birds overhead, but it just feels like you've slipped through a, a time warp and have become two, well, either two soldiers or you've, you've, you're in World War I there. Um, and in the talking, there's something, I guess, like a pilgrimage in following in someone's footsteps. It's not just to arrive at a sacred place, 
but it's the process of going through your what your predecessors have been through that helps you absorb who who they were and i think the two the two actors in this stanza have become the people they've been talking about in by walking the routes that they walked and then we come to the sesta and but shows us okay we've got a, a volta we've got a turn here what um what's happening but soon will come a style or a gate that you or i must climb to take a different path and i just i see frost all over that um and the road not taken and it's not you and I, but you or I. So the, the friendship is parting here. And I also did a little bit of homework and read about Frost um, and the circumstances of him writing The Road Not Taken. And the funny thing about that, I mean, the, that poem in America, I don't know what it's like, like Jerusalem here or something. It's, it's taught and misunderstood all over the place. And in certainly in junior high school English class, it was held up as the great hymn to rugged individuality. And um, and it's you know it's not it's not called the road taken. <laughs> it's called the road not taken, and you know it's got a kind of shoulda woulda coulda thing going on. And what I read was that that Frost had written it for Thomas as a as a joke about Thomas's indecisiveness on walks, and that whatever route they took, he then regretted it and thought, oh, it should have been the other one. And it didn't go down well with Thomas. Um, I mean, joking about someone's indecisiveness when you know them to be depressed is a little tactless to say the least. Um, I mean, I, I assume Frost understood that he, that Thomas was depressed. Maybe he didn't. Um, in any case, it didn't go down well. Um, and in this, this the, the final lines, I'm, I, I'm gonna read the, the whole, the last six lines, because I just think it's a, it's a single sentence and it's just stunning. But soon will come a style or gate that you or I must climb to take a different path. And all along your homeward grass or earth by field, by farther field, keep talking through the clamor of the trees and all the birds, please, even if I can't make out the words. And the, the, the one word in that that just gives me a lump in the throat is is please it's it it's not it's not beseeching it's it's a child in the dark who's afraid please please keep talking to me um asking for reassurance but trying to be brave and also it's it just is beautiful with the trees for the the previous line that um that's really lovely. Um, so after all this talk about talk, it, it turns out in the end that it's not the words that are important, it's the sound, it's the connection. Right. And it's the music. Um, and yeah, that's, that's my reading. Okay. Thank you. Well, that, that I, I'm, I'm very touched. You've said some extravagantly kind things there. Um, one, one of which, which I have to take issue with. I, I think if I were to claim that the two actors in this piece had become Frost and Thomas, <laughs> that might be going a little bit far. But, um, but gosh, yeah, would like to. Um, I'll just follow up on what you're saying about the sound of the words, because if you go back to line four in stanza one, 
um, listen for the cadence of their talk. So what Matthew and I were doing was following literally in the footsteps of Frost and Thomas doing walks that they had done. Mm -hmm. And of course, as we did those walks, we talked about them an awful lot. And we talked about our own writing and, you know, our frustrations and anxieties about it. And um, we talked a lot about Frost's he had not even a theory, an observation, I suppose, that if you listen to somebody talking in the next room and you can't make out the words, but you can hear the cadence of their language, you can sort of tell what they're saying anyway. <laughs> um, and you can sort of follow a conversation without being able to hear any of the words at all, just by the, you know, is the tone of voice tender or is it raging? You know, is it full of pauses and all of that? And we, we talked about that idea an awful lot. Um, and particularly the idea that as two people separate geographically, you know, just move apart from each other, the words do become difficult to hear, but you can still yell to someone from the other end of a field and you'll know whether they hate you or they love you um, from the tone of voice. And there was something very sort of powerful and plangent in that idea for me. Um, and yeah, these these. Matthew is is one of my dearest dearest friends and I you know I adored spending this time with him in Dimmock and these poems really did just fall out of me one every morning um and I I, I consider them gifts because they just landed I didn't do any work um and no I mean it's it's pretty much true uh and Matthew really was pissed off <laughs> it was, he was so I would be <laughs> yeah, yeah. um but they, all four of them are explorations of friendship and writing and conversation. And the, I think one of, the, one of the reasons that they fell out the way they did was because I was sort of subconsciously composing them while we were walking. And I think they formed themselves long before I sat down at the notepad. Yeah. Um, and I think it was all to do with two things. The rhythm of the walking, and you can hear the rhythm, I'm conscious, mm -hmm. you can hear the rhythm in that mm -hmm. poem particularly. Um, but also, the nature of conversation while walking is very different from the nature of conversation while sitting across a table from yes. someone. Because yeah. you're not looking into each other's eyes, and yeah. you have that kind of... I mean, I know this is a commonly observed phenomenon, it's not me telling you anything you don't know, but that, that feature of talking as your side by side is of a different quality. Yeah, um, it's why um, it's why. Yeah, I'm just thinking it's why children in cars always ask really awkward questions while you're driving because yeah. you're you're not looking at each yeah. other. Yeah. So basically, I spent four days saying to Matthew Hollis, "Are we nearly there yet? Are we nearly there?" Yet? <laughs> um, but I did. I do think it gave us a, a particularly sort of deep quality to the conversation that we. That sounds really wanky. I'm so sorry. But it, it gave a it gave a peculiar quality to the conversations that we were having that we may not mm -hmm. have had in other circumstances. Yes. So the walking became not necessarily the subject of all of those poems, although it's clearly in there. But it became the kind of driver of the poems yeah. and the yeah. the originator of the poems as well. Um, mm -hmm. So. So yeah, it did. I mean, I remember when you asked me to do this, I couldn't really think of any of my poems that had anything to do with walking. And then it, it rather took you to point that out to me. <laughs> thing. So thank you sort of, just as you were saying before, you know, somebody points something out to you that, yeah. that is implicit in the work, but you hadn't quite been conscious of. Yes. But yeah. there it is. And as I said earlier on, isn't that fun? Isn't it just... And we're really running out of time. I can't believe how quickly this went, but I just wanted to talk about the word cadence because it, it does so much work. Um, when we get into the guns and the fighters overhead, yeah. it, it's, I suddenly read it in a military way of the, the cadences of marches. Okay, uh, well, I, I certainly hadn't thought or intended that, but great, great, good. Right. Right. For me, it was a, it's about the dying fall of a sound. It's the, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the thing. but it's also the term for those gum, ba, 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 do, 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 that American soldiers learn these Is songs. Right? Okay, they're, right. they're called cadences. My my late brother taught me quite a few of them that are 
Good not repeatable. <laughs> that, that was that was certainly not uppermost in my head. So that's good. Yeah, to yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, we're going to have to wrap it up. Um, it's been really, really great having you here. And um, yeah, there's another one next month and I'll hand it back to Andrew to say goodbye to everybody. Thank you all for coming. Thanks for inviting me to join you, Lydia. And it's thank you, great. Andrew, for hosting us. Um, okay, well, uh, thanks to both of you because that was a fascinating conversation. Thank you very much. Now.